And uh, yeah, uh, I don't know how people initially. So I'm going to just put these on the floor. Is that right? Um, how p people initially react to that, but because it's not, it's not very fun. <laughs> it's not very joyful. It's a little bit difficult. I find it difficult anyway. There are some messages in there, including genocide, um, which seem to be God-sanctioned. And um, yeah, I don't know when I originally read it. It's like <laughs> what is going on here? So we'll 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 get there uh, in a minute. But first. Um, we, we've had, a, I think, two reminders already of what Robin spoke about last week, so I don't need to remind you again or in no particular depth. So we're talking about anointing in this series and um, this idea of bridging heaven and earth. And uh, that bridge we saw last week with the stairway to heaven in Genesis 28 and the themes that Robin was talking about, about turning the ordinary into the holy and changing name and changing status. There was a new name for this place that became Bethel, the house of the Lord. Um, and uh, what's his face? Jacob then anoints the stone. Do you remember that? That was his pillow. He anoints it. And that's a, a, a special moment and a, a transforming moment. So it's all about this gateway between heaven and earth. That's what anointing is about. And when I say heaven... We're not talking about the kind of medieval pictures of heaven where heaven's up there and hell's down there because, let's be honest, heaven can't be up there because if we were in Australia, heaven would kind of be there and, you know, it, it wouldn't work from that perspective. So we have these, uh, or at least as a child, I had these kind of rather simplistic views of, of heaven. But heaven really is God's realm. It's God's dimension. And sometimes we, we glimpse it, sometimes we see bits of it, we see bits of God's rule and reign coming, his transforming power on earth, uh, and that's what it really means to bring heaven to earth, to bring his transforming rule and reign to earth. And of course, heaven and earth were always supposed to be together. If you look at the, the biblical story, in Eden, God's realm and our realm are together. There's, there's a natural um, synergy in coming together between the two. And if you look right at the end of the Bible in Revelation, what do we see there? The same thing. Heaven coming down to earth and the two becoming one. So that's what this is all about. And anointing is all about being marked out as a follower of Christ, as people carrying his blessing, called to be his people and to carry out his purposes. That, that's what we're talking about. So anointing really is about being dedicated to God or commissioned to carry out a particular purpose or a particular purpose function and in a generic sense that's this idea of bringing heaven to earth but for each of us personally that might be something different specifically in our day-to-day -day lives and we'll talk about that in a bit so today we're talking about the anointed king number one this is kind of like the bad anointed king and i think robin's given himself the good anointed king next week which is uh, which is david sorry it's chronological exactly what can you do so uh, originally anointing was all about priests that's what uh, you'll, you'll read in the Old Testament. So when we saw the, or had the anointing passage read earlier on, it was very specifically, he said, I anoint you as ruler, because that wasn't the normal way of doing things within Israel. Um, and today, actually, that kind of idea of anointing someone as a ruler is probably, if you to ask someone generally about the idea of anointing, if they had any kind of association with anointing, it might be that because we had it quite recently uh, in this country, uh, anointing, and I've, I've got a picture of that coming up in a minute. But the idea of anointing monarchs, anointing kings, that's probably the only place that we would see it on the news or in popular culture at all today is within that context. So actually it kind of, it fits. But th today we're talking about not so much the anointing of King Charles III, although I will mention it, but about Saul, the first king of Israel, going right back to the start of the Israel story. And it's not a very happy story at all. Um, and and it's, it's really difficult. But even the background to it is bad. So the people of Israel say to God, we'd really like a king, please. And God says, no, you don't. That's a really, actually, that's a bad idea. And plus, I'm your king, I'm your ruler, you should look to me. No, no, we, we really do want a king. No, it's, it's really a bad idea because kings kind of get a bit power hungry, they need loads of servants, they need looking after, they get a bit greedy, the, all the power goes to their heads. And Israel keep going on saying, no, everyone else has got a king, can't we have a king? <laughs> okay, and finally God relents, he says, okay, you can have a king. And Samuel goes and anoints 
the king, who's to be Saul. And actually, right at the start, it doesn't look too bad. You know, Saul gets anointed, he meets these prophets, and he has this wild, prophetic, spirit-filled experience. It looks like this might be the guy, and he does a, f a few good things at the start. But then it really, really quickly unravels, at least in the biblical narrative, within about two or three chapters, it unravels. And God says, right, that's it. That's the end of your line. He gets to continue being king for kind of 40 odd years, but it never creates the dynasty. And that's really the thing about being a monarch, isn't it? Generally that your kids come after you and, and the way that it, it runs through. Um, so his, his role and his position moves to David and his line and Solomon and all the rest of it. But we'll, we'll come back to that. So let's start by thinking about monarchs and anointing. And as I said, we had one of these quite recently. Um, did anyone watch the, the coronation? You know, watch it. It was long, wasn't it? I mean, was it like two, three hours or something? Or I might be mixing that up with the Queen's funeral. But they, they were both very, very long. Um, and all this ceremony and pomp and all the rest of it that goes with it. Um, does anyone remember seeing the anointing part of that service? It's a trick question. Yeah, exactly. You can't have seen the anointing part of the service because you know it's happening because... Hugh Edwards, with his dulcet tones, is telling you what's going on behind a screen. But you, you don't actually see that bit of the ceremony because that's seen as the really, really sacred bit of the ceremony. That's just a bridge too far. That isn't for the, to be broadcast to the world. That's a, a private and, and sacred part of the ceremony. But it did get me thinking, I wonder what, what oil they used for this, picking up on what Robin was talking about last week. And there is... Th there's, there's a biblical recipe for anointing oil. So if you're ever interested in just p putting a bit of holy oil together, have a look at Exodus 30. That's the place to go. And it's these five things. Um, and it has the, the particular um, proportions in which you should make it as well. So you get that all right. And these are your five things. So liquid myrrh, cinnamon, aromatic cane, cassia, and olive oil. I think most people might have olive oil at home, but they might might struggle with the other, oh, cinnamon, I suppose. Um, <laughs> can you make your own anointing oil? Yeah. Um, and, and some people actually in these five uh, ingredients see symbolism and quite a lot of depth. So, for example, myrrh, we know about myrrh because it's a gift for Jesus at his birth, and we see that in an embalming sense, looking forward um, towards his death and resurrection. But actually it was a purifier as well. So this idea of purification coming through. Um, cinnamon and uh, cane, the aromatic cane, are very sweet. And this idea of exuding the sweetness of, of God, the kind, gentle, loving fragrance of Christ. Um, cassia, I hadn't come across before. People familiar with cassia? No? Apparently it's a herb. Um, and you have to, it, it grows in very wet places, kind of swampy places. So this idea that we have to be planted deep in the living water is that what some people see as the symbolism in that. And you see that in our symbol as, as a church. We have that as well, the, the tree going down into the water. Um, and then finally, there's olive oil. Not only is olive oil the superfood in the sense that it's brilliant for you and it in kind of encapsulates so much goodness, the making of oil uh, requires a bit of shaking and stirring and crushing and uh, perhaps looking at some of the difficulties that we might face in the course of the Christian life. So quite a lot of things wrapped up in there. Which then yeah, made me wonder how that then c compares to what King Charles III had in his oil. So apart from olive oil, he had sesame, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, so that's the, the one common factor, neroli, benzoine, uh, amber, and orange blossom. And the olive bit, the olives from the olive oil, came from the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. They took it to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The uh, Anglican Archbishop blessed it with the Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem, who's brilliantly called his Beatitude, Theophilus III, and they consecrated it together. And something actually I read which was really nice about this and picks up on part of what Robin was doing last week when he anointed Lear, is that with, the, with water, which we see in baptism, that's very much about washing things away, whereas oil is really sticky. Um, which is unpleasant from one perspective. But from another, it's a really nice symbol of the stickiness of the anointing, the stickiness of the blessing, that it doesn't just wash away, but it's something that stays with us. Um, 
Incidentally, by the way, I don't know if people are connoisseurs of anointing oil because there were there were three things missing from King Charles's oil, which were in Elizabeth II's anointing oil. All right, I'll uh, I, I'll give you a multiple choice question on what they are. They're all animal related, so um, uh, so I've given you s six options. Three of these are true things which were missing from the anointing oil for King Charles III, and three I've just made up. So uh, your six options are bear, cat, locust, sperm whale, deer, and lion. So three kind of bits of these animals were involved in Elizabeth II's anointing oil, and three were not. Three I've just added for confusion purposes. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. He did. He, he didn't like the idea of any animal cruelty, so that's why that was all all taken out. But um, yeah, any any guesses? Sperm, sperm whale. Correct. Yep. So sperm whale was in Elizabeth II's. Uh, more specifically, the ambergris, which um, I don't need to explain you, to you what that is, but for people who haven't come across it, the stomach lining of a sperm whale that went in Elizabeth II's. Any others? No, I'm afraid lion. Lion is there to mislead you. Lion is there. Deer. Yep, the secretions of a musk deer is what you would have found in Elizabeth II's anointing oil. And one more. Locust. Now, I'm afraid that that's there to deceive you. So, cat. Yes, the the civet cat, the glands, in fact, of a civet cat, um, which I had to look that up. Apparently, it's a fairly wild cat in Africa and. Asia nocturnal, pretty difficult to find. So I guess if you need the glands of a civet cat, that's going to take you a little, li little bit of work. Anyway, there we go. After that little excursus, back to Saul. So I don't know about you, but as I say, I find the story uncomfortable. Actually, reading it, I find it pretty uncomfortable. So I think there are. Well, you, you've got the point where. Obviously, God's saying you don't need a king anyway, but then he chooses to anoint someone through Samuel. So he picks someone for this job. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there are basically two major things that go wrong. One we read about with the Amalekites and one appears in between, which is to do with Saul offering a sacrifice and not waiting for Samuel. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And then there's this idea of genocide, basically. I told you to kill all of the Amalekites and you only killed most of them. You didn't kill their king, and you didn't kill the good cattle, the good sheep, the good goats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I don't know if that makes anyone else feel uncomfortable, but it really makes me feel very uncomfortable. The idea that this is seemingly God-mandated genocide, I guess we would call it, wiping out a whole people group. The other thing is, even if he was supposed to do those things, was it really that bad that God would then turn around and say, that's it, sorry, time's up for you? You know, David did terrible stuff, murder, adultery, you know, all lots of other awful things he was involved with. Solomon, don't even go there. They don't seem to get the anointing withdrawn in quite the same way that Saul does for just these. They get some consequences, but just not consequences on this scale. They don't get their line wiped out from the royal order. Um, and I think when I was looking at this, I thought, well, I'm just going to have to do the hard work of reading the Old Testament in its context and in its world. <laughs> Because if I just come at it fresh, this is um, it's going to probably lead me uh, in a direction where I'm just ignorant of quite a lot of the things which are otherwise going on here. So what, what are the three troubling bits? Well, for me, they were this, this sacrifice incident. Was it really that bad that Saul made the sacrifice and not Samuel? This slaughtering of the Amalekites. And then this idea that there was no redemption for Saul. There was seemingly no way back once he'd made these two or three mistakes. That was it. Um, so let's talk about this sacrifice story to start off with. This, this wasn't in the bit that we read earlier, so I'll just do a very quick summary of it. So it's 1 Samuel 13. So there's a battle with the Philistines. The Israelites are massively outnumbered, and they're scared. They're really scared. If you read the bit in 1 Samuel 13 later, they're hiding in caves. You know, they're, they're petrified. They don't really know what to do. Samuel is due to come in seven days. That was in the passage we read earlier, actually, where he said, go down to Gibeah and I'll, I'll, or Gilgal, and I'll come in seven days. Samuel's late, right? Samuel doesn't show. He said, I'm coming in seven days. Seven days are up. Samuel's not there. So Saul 
is in a pretty tough situation in that circumstance. What should he do? Does he just wait for the Philistines to come and attack him? I'm sorry, I should say the, the purpose of the sacrifice is that they go to God and they ask him for help. They ask him what he's saying about this particular situation and they ask him to in intervene in a seemingly impossible situation. So, yeah, so it seems that he's got kind of four options here, Saul. First one, wait for the Philistines to come down the mountain to attack and don't bother seeking God's help. We just haven't got time for this. We've just got to, well, th they're just going to come and I can't do anything about it. Second one, should, should he take the initiative? Should he strike back? He'll go against the Philistines, try and catch them on the hoof, with also without seeking God's help, because Samuel hasn't turned up yet. Third thing, does Saul say, actually, Samuel's not here, I'll do it instead. I'll do the offering, I'll seek God's help in this uh, situation. Fourthly, does he wait for Samuel to show up, but in the meantime, are some of his soldiers going to run away? Because they're all scared. Uh, and by that stage, there'll be virtually nothing left. The Philistines will come in and just rout the lot of them. I mean, it doesn't, feels like four pretty bad options <laughs> as these things go. And from my perspective, reading them fresh, this idea that he might just take the initiative and do the sacrifice doesn't sound like the worst of those are four options by any measure. But the point is here that, that Saul is God's anointed. That's what he, and he's supposed to be in step with God in terms of what he does. And he needs to show trust and obedience in God in order to get the, the best outcomes and to, to show that he is the person for this job. And instead what he did is he chose to take matters into his own hands without showing trust and patience and the security of knowing that God would intervene. So that was the sacrifice story. What about the, the Amalekites? Um, not kind of library footage this but uh, so someone had painted up this this battle of the Amalekites um, and looking at the Amalekites it seems they're a bit like Genghis Khan and the Mongol army I don't know if that means anything to people so Genghis Khan captured you know, vast amounts of the world from Mongolia but was utterly ruthless and cruel on a scale that you couldn't possibly imagine and admittedly the world's population was smaller at the time but he and his army are said to have killed 10 to 20 percent of the entirety of the world's population as they went around the world you know, gaining territory and effectively just trying to take over and it seems that the Amalekites are in a similar mold well that's what the the biblical story tells us they, they were actually distant relatives of the Israelites if you trace it back through the biblical narrative it goes to Isaac and Rebecca and then Abraham and Sarah um, and that there's a particular story involving the, um, the Amalekites which helps us understand a little bit of how they're seen in this story and what their symbolism is in this story. So in Exodus, and it's mentioned actually in the thing that we read earlier, in Exodus 17, as the Israelites were leaving Egypt and going towards Sinai, they got attacked by the Amalekites. And there, there's an extra overlay in Deuteronomy 25 which helps us understand this a little bit more. And it seems that the, the Israelites were really tired they're in a really weary, worn out state. And what the Amalekites did was, was attack them in that moment. And not only that, they attacked the people at the back of the group, which are the people who are usually the weakest, the most worn out, the sick, the people who were just in the worst possible state. So they basically, the Amalekites, the symbol of the Amalekites is they're the people who prey on the weak, on the weakest. They take advantage of the people who are least able to defend themselves. And that is what God really hates. People who don't have human instinct or reverence for God. And it seems that that is really what this story is about. It's about God saying, you know, there are some things I just can't abide. Um, and I think there's, we can talk about how literal the Amalekite grouping is because they actually reappear in Esther <laughs> later on. So the idea that they're entirely wiped out is, can go one way or another. But, but essentially here in this story, they stand for people who are opposed to God's purposes. People who are opposed to God's redemption of the world. People who take unprincipled, violent actions against the weak. And that's what God really doesn't like. And Saul didn't take that commitment seriously enough. As God's anointed, he was supposed to be in tune with God's heart. And God's heart was for the weak and for the poor and for the oppressed. And this story, I think, is a symbol of the way that Paul, uh, that Saul didn't really get to grips with that. They also, much more than that, there was all the bits about how they, you know, they saved all the good cattle for themselves. 
all the the good goats and, and then he, they made up a story quickly saying oh yes we were planning to sacrifice those and i think that probably wasn't very true um and the point with that is they they weren't supposed to be doing this to enrich themselves it wasn't about personal gain that wasn't the point behind all of this so when god saw what saul was up to and how he approached these things he was saying if this isn't the guy after my own heart. This isn't the person who cares about the things that I really care about and approaches these things in the same way. So we look at the, the symbols behind this story. We see something of the heart of God coming through. And what about this third point? Was Saul beyond redemption? Because it seems, as I say, there's these two m fairly minor indiscretions, one about offering a sacrifice and one about you know, not wiping out everyone. And maybe because of the symbolism I've talked about, they'd look a little bit more significant than they did. But still, did he really deserve the pronouncements that came? Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That's what came through Samuel to Saul. Um, and I think the way I best understand that is I don't think that was necessarily the final word on Saul's situation. Because the Old Testament is littered with times when God said, this is going to happen and ultimately God changes his mind or something intervenes and people repent and the situation is turned around. So in Exodus 32 it says the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. God was going to had in mind to do something and because the way they changed and they repented then he, he decided to go in a different direction. Same in Jonah. The message to Nineveh was 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That was it. That was the statement. And yet they repented and they turned around and God said, okay, we can go in a different direction. And there are other stories like that throughout the Old Testament. So I reckon actually Saul wasn't beyond redemption. I think if he truly repented and he really wanted this in the way that David did, and that's one reason why David might have been treated differently, because even though there is something here of Saul repenting, it all seemed to be about him. You know, it's like, I'm going to repent, but could you come with me so I don't lose face in front of everyone else? You know, and then he built a statue to himself and all of these kinds of things. And he, again, wasn't as God's anointed seeking after God's heart. What he was actually doing was looking to make himself look good. And I think at that point, God was saying, well, maybe not you're not the man for the job anymore. That's why the anointing seems to have been taken from him and say, OK, that's it. Thus far and no further. So the question for me is then after all of that, what does it mean for us? What do we take from this as anointed people, as people who see ourselves as anointed by the Spirit? And I think it's in part that being anointed isn't for our benefit, really. It's as God's representative. It's so that we can carry out God's purposes in the world because we are anointed for a purpose. And it was these three things which have come up very small, which um, I wanted us just to think about in the kind of in the last few minutes and then maybe we'll have a bit of time of silence for us to reflect on them before we go into our final song and the first is if we're talking about purpose and as I say I think this is about capturing and pursuing a particular aspect of God's heart or God's character in the Amalekite story it was it was care for the weak that was the aspect of God's character which is shown there um, and, and what, what is it? What particular aspect of heaven does God want us to bring to earth um, in, in a purpose for our lives? And I think for some people they might say, well, I don't really know what that is. I don't know what that purpose is, because I think for all of us, there could be something unique. There's the general, you know, love God, love our neighbor. That's fine. But that's a bit generic. You know, what, what is it for me personally? What does that mean in practice? And I think some people will either just not know or perhaps may have known but thought well you know that's kind of come to completion that's kind of run its course is there something new is there something different that God wants me to do to bring heaven to earth and and I think it's quite circumstance specific I remember when we uh, were living in Hong Kong and we had little children and life just they're slightly bigger now they're still quite little um, but you know it's just that exhausting all-consuming time of life and I was just saying God what 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 do you want me to be doing what's the purpose in this particular situation and apart from you know doing a j good job when I'm at work it was like can you just do your best to be a good dad and if that's all you can manage at the moment just do that um, and and it's important he said as well because there are some people for whom that isn't a priority and I, I remember a couple of times thinking that 
just getting little bits of confirmation. I remember once we had, even I had lunch with Dan when he was like three months old, and we sat outside the cathedral in Hong Kong, and this guy came over and he said, I just really want to commend you for, you know, taking the time out to do this. Um, and, and one of my colleagues spoke to another friend of ours who they happened to come across and say, you know, it's really good. I noticed Richard's got a lot of time for his family and he even makes that really important, which isn't a given for um, people in that culture for, for various different reasons at different times. Um, and I don't feel like God said don't be a good dad anymore, but I, I do feel like he's now saying there might be some more things to add to that because there's some things which just need a little bit less time than they did. And so more recently, if Phil has been talking to me about prisons and I went to visit a prison recently and look at what a particular Christian organization are doing in prisons. Um, so, yeah, so on that one, may maybe there are things that you feel that you, you feel you had a clear idea of what it was, but life's moved on. And it's kind of been completed. But maybe also uh, God's just got something new or something fresh for you, which you just need to take a bit of time and say, God, what is it that you really care about? As you're anointed, what are the things that you want me in my unique position and my unique gifting to do? Second thing that came to is that you, you might know the purpose, but you just lost sight of it a bit, you know, just a bit tired or discouraged, which is completely natural in so many ways, in so many circumstances in life. And there's encouragement today to keep going to persevere um and and this idea you know of, of redemption that you can always go again you can always go again and i think that comes through over and over again as i said in the old testament even if things go off track a little bit that nothing is beyond redemption you can always go again and 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 restart and then the third thing we maybe we we know the purpose we haven't really lost sight of it but we're just not really sure how to get there and just encouraging us into obedience and trust and not taking matters into our own hands because that's essentially what Saul came a cropper on by trying to take things into his own hands but even when the message from God is difficult or it's um, it's hard to understand or you know we're just tempted to try and fix it <laughs> ourselves that actually just giving things over to God and allowing him to direct and and a mold and move us in a particular direction. I think that came through in what we were singing earlier on and some of the words that came out of it. You know, just being open to God to say, how do you want me to achieve this thing that I feel that you've called me to do? And not assuming that we know the answer. Not assuming that we know what God is telling us to do and how to, how to do it. And so, as we, um, as we wrap up, maybe we just spend a couple of minutes in silence just thinking about whether any of those three things apply to you where you are at the moment. And I think particularly for people looking for purpose, it may be that God miraculously puts something in your mind, but equally often I think with those things, a lot to be said for praying with people you trust and bouncing things off them and saying, you know, I think God might be pushing me in this direction. But maybe that process at least can start today as we have a bit of time of um, silence and, and reflection. Um, and maybe we just need to hear God's little voice saying, yeah, you're doing really well. <laughs> you're doing really well. Keep going. You feel like it's hard going. You feel like you've lost sight of it a little bit. But keep going because nothing is beyond the pale, beyond redemption. It's It can all come to life again and be reinvigorated and revived. And this idea of, you know, even if it's hard just to wait for God and wait for him to intervene in certain circumstances, Unlike Saul, we don't take matters into our own hands. So let's just have some silence. Think about those points. And they're probably good things to think about in home group this week, picking up on what we were talking about before in that forum. And after that, I'll just close in prayer. And then I think we've probably got a song and a couple of things to finish.
Lord, we thank you that you've anointed us for good deeds, Lord, to bring your love and your spirit and your presence into this world, to bring those aspects of heaven, that perfect realm that you inhabit, Lord, and you bring those to earth to impact and affect the world around us so the people can see your goodness. And Lord, we pray that you would give us all a sense of, of purpose, a sense of vision of what it is that you've got for us in that particular context. Lord, what aspect of heaven you want to bring to earth through us, Lord, be it in our families or our friendships, our relationships, our interests, our hobbies, our clubs, our, our work, um, charity work, Lord, volunteering, whatever it may be, Father, we thank you for all these opportunities that are around us and we pray that you would revive our sense of purpose and you would revive us to keep going particularly where we've been plugging away at things for years and years and years and sometimes sometimes we become a bit less enthusiastic about it lord and we pray that you would revive and reinvigorate and and restore and seal in us lord the sense of of that being what you have for us and that you are empowering us and going with us and lord when we're in the midst of it we pray that we would have that sense of trust and obedience even to do things which might feel a bit awkward or difficult or counterintuitive, Lord, but just knowing that as you're anointed, Lord, we want to be in step with you. We want to hear what you're saying and we want to be that gateway, Lord, for your rule and reign to come to earth.